Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this afternoon's lecture. My name is Kathleen Sproles Cummings. I'm the director of the Kushma Center for the Study of American Catholicism and a faculty member in the Departments of American Studies and History here at Notre Dame. Um, I'd like to recognize and thank other members of the Kushwa staff who are here, especially uh, Shane Albrecht in the back and Madonna No, also standing next to him, who helped um, coordinate and plan this event. And especially Pete Chaika, who, I, where's Pete? I just saw him. Did he sneak out? Okay, Pete's infant son is attending his very first Kushwa event. <laughs> Uh, we like to start them early, uh, but uh, Pete was instrumental in organizing in, in the initiative and organization of this event, so I wanted to thank him. And again, welcome to everyone, especially those of you who may be attending a Kushwa Center event for the first time. I see a lot of familiar faces, but also some new ones. And with that in mind, before I introduce this afternoon's speaker, I want to draw your attention to an event we're planning for the fall semester um, in uh, partnership with our colleagues here at the Hesburgh Library. Uh, in November, we are planning another event here in Rare Books and Special Collections, this wonderful venue, um, where we're in the process of confirming that Father Clarence Williams will speak on the experience of black Catholic, black Catholic clergy in the 20th century, and more specifically on the history of the National Black Catholic Clergy Caucus, which marks its 50th anniversary this year, and whose papers were recently donated to the University of Notre Dame archives. So it's, of course, early, but uh, please keep this in mind and stay tuned for further information about that in November. Back to today. Uh, we're very fortunate to welcome, there's Pete. Pete, I just said all these nice things about you and Sorry. thanked you. That's all right. Um, <laughs> we're very fortunate to have as our guest Matthew Kressler, an assistant professor of religious studies at the College of Charleston in South Carolina. Matthew earned his PhD in Religious Studies from Northwestern University and holds an MTS in Religions of the Americas from Harvard Divinity School. He teaches uh, an astonishing variety, an interesting variety of courses on African American religion, religion, race, and politics, religion in America, black nationalism, and theory and method in the study of religion. Matthew is the author of Authentically Black and Truly Catholic, The Rise of Black Catholicism in the Great Migration, just published by New York University Press. And as uh, you may have seen on your way in, copies of Matthew's book are available for sale in the Library of Concourse, and I have a suspicion he will not mind <laughs> signing copies of those books. Not at, all, not at all. Matthew has published in journals such as the U.S. Catholic Historian, the Journal of Africana Religions, and American Catholic Studies. He's a regular contributor to the Religion in American History blog, and has written for Slate and other online publications as well. He's currently working on an article manuscript um, titled <coughs> Categorizing Catholic Racism, which discusses white Catholic resistance to desegregation in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And we were fortunate to discuss uh, some of that research and progress with Matthew at the Colloquium on Religion and History this afternoon <coughs> with graduate students and faculty from Notre Dame's History Department. Matthew uh, has just been selected as a member of the 2018 cohort of Young Scholars in American Religion Program, which is a prestigious program housed at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and supported by the Lilly Endowment. This program assists the next generation of leading scholars in the field of American religion through networking and mentoring for teaching, research, and professional development. So we congratulate Matthew on this exciting opportunity, even as we realize that um, this means that he will be leaving immediately after today's lecture because uh, the requirement is that he be in Indianapolis uh, by this evening. But congratulations, Matthew. Today, he joins us to discuss the history of the National Black, Black Catholic Clergy Caucus at its 50th anniversary, and more broadly, the subject of his new book, which benefited a great deal from research conducted here at the Notre Dame Archives. The title of Matthew's talk today is Centering Black Catholics, Reimagining American Catholicism. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Kressler. Hey, y'all. Um, I may or may not have brought the warm weather with me from South Carolina, so the fact that there isn't snow on the ground anymore, um, you're welcome. Um, but actually, maybe more to the point, uh, thank you for being here uh, when you could be outside in the beautiful, uh, not snowy weather. Um, I really am honored to be here. Thank you so much, Kathy, for that um, 
overly generous introduction. Um, the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism, uh, as I prepared for this talk and was thinking back, has supported the better part of the last decade of my life. I was here first uh, with the Kushwa grant to do dissertation research. Um, I was here second and third to um, attend a conference on the lived history of Vatican II run by Kushwa. And here I am uh, with a PhD in hand um, to uh, deliver a talk. So I'm really uh, humbled to be in your presence. Um, I want to thank Kathy again, Shane, Madonna, and especially Pete for making my stay so um, welcoming and wonderful. Um, thank you to the Notre Dame Rare Books Library uh, and to the archives. And I will, I think, hope to pause a few times just to note, like, that's from the Notre Dame archives, that's from the Notre Dame archives, so any budding uh, historians can actually um, check my work, so to speak, and, and check out the great resources of the archives. Um, and last but not least, I can't be at Notre Dame without congratulating the national champion basketball team. Um, my father-in-law wanted me, insisted that I make sure to note that Muffet McGraw went to his high school, Bishop of Shanahan, and to his college, St. Joe's, and that her sister was in his high school class. So, <laughs> Jerry, that was for you. <laughs> but thank you for being here, and without further ado, I will start my talk. The Catholic Church in the United States, primarily a white racist institution, has addressed itself primarily to white society and definitely is a part of that society." End quote. Fifty years ago, next Wednesday, 58 black priests, joined by at least one brother and woman religious, drafted the inaugural statement of the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus in Detroit, Michigan. These were its opening words, and they were not chosen lightly. According to Father Larry Lucas, a key figure in the burgeoning black Catholic movement, it took until 3 a.m. of our last morning together and four separate final votes to maintain the word racist to describe the present reality in the church. But maintain it they did. And in doing so, they sent shockwaves across Catholic America. Considering the fact that when black Catholics are considered at all, they tend to be cast as conservative, this statement is remarkable for just how radical it was. The priests accused the church of past complicity with an active support of white supremacy. They demanded that black people control their own affairs. And perhaps, and I think most surprisingly of all, they insisted that the same principles on which we justify legitimate self-defense and just warfare must be applied to violence when it represents black response to white violence. Now was the time for black Catholics to direct the mission of the church in the black community. For, quote, unless the church, by an immediate, effective, and total reversing of its present practices, rejects and denounces all forms of racism within its ranks and institutions and in the society of which she is a part, she will become unacceptable in the black community." End quote. This first ever coming together of black clergy had its roots in a revolution sweeping the country. Though the two words do not appear in the statement itself, perhaps they were left on that cutting room floor of those late night debates, the influence of black power emanates from, en from every syllable in the statement. Malcolm X founded the Organization for Afro-American Unity in 1964, just a few months before he was assassinated in February 1965. In 1966, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale founded the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in Oakland, California. Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton published Black Power, The Politics of Liberation in 1967 where they characterized African Americans as an internally colonized people and called for black self-determination. These were the years, in other words, when legislative civil rights victories were followed swiftly by long, hot summers of urban uprisings sparked by police brutality and murder. This was the context in which black Catholics charged the church with being a white racist institution. 
This critique was already starting to circulate in the months leading up to the founding of the clergy caucus. Seven black priests, for instance, in Chicago accused their archdiocese of enlightened paternalism in February of 1968. But it was the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. that served as the spark that would ignite the black Catholic movement. King was shot on April 4th, 1968. On April 5th, Mayor Richard J. Daley, the white Catholic mayor of an overwhelmingly white Catholic police force, authorized Chicago police to shoot to kill all arsonists and to shoot to maim looters. And just two weeks later, on April 18th, 1968, the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus was born. The special caucus was convened by Father Herman Porter of Rockford, Illinois, and met the same, it met in the same day and in the same hotel as the Catholic Clergy Conference on the Interracial Apostolate, signaling a shift in Catholic engagement with black freedom struggles. In the words of Sister Mary Martin de Porres Gray, this marked the commencement of black consciousness for black Catholics. Um, Sister Gray was then a Sister of Mercy. She is now Dr. Patricia Gray. Gray was present at the clergy caucus's founding, though she was prohibited from full participation. So she convened the National Black Sisters Conference in August of that same year. Quote, organized to challenge these nuns to be reborn into involvement in the liberation of black people as celibate, black, and committed women, end quote. The sisters' statement was no less radical than that of the priests. They denounced the racism found in our society and within our church, declaring them both to be categorically evil and inimical, um, inimical to the freedom of all men everywhere and particularly destructive of black people in America. The sisters pledged themselves to work unceasingly for the liberation of black people by promoting a positive self-image among black folk and stimulating community action achieved at the, achieve, aimed at the achievement of social, political, and economic black power." End quote. The National Convention of Black Lay Catholics soon followed suit, organized in 1969, and by 1970, allied organizations had exerted enough pressure on the National, of, on the national Conference of Catholic Bishops to win official approval for a national office for black Catholics some of whose papers are collected here in uh, the library. Over the next decade, this black Catholic movement transformed what it meant to be both black and Catholic. And it forwarded, I would argue, the most substantial and sustained critique of the American church's complicity in white supremacy to date. 50 years have passed, and we, Catholics, and historians of Catholics have yet to fully reckon with the implications this history has for how we understand American Catholicism. It is not simply that too few Catholics know this story or that too few historians tell stories like it. The problem, I'd argue, is that we have yet to learn the lessons this revolutionary moment has to offer with regard to how we understand Catholic history in the United States. Today I'm going to argue that when we center black Catholics in our studies of U.S. Catholicism, they force us to reckon with the limitations of our own concepts. For too long, scholars have treated American Catholicism as if it were an innocent, race-neutral category. The black Catholics who embraced black power in the 1960s and 1970s revealed the hypocrisy inherent in that assumption. They're naming the U.S. church a white racist institution alongside their struggle to bring to life a black one illuminates what remains hidden in plain sight, hidden in plain sight if we're willing to see it. Namely that Catholicism, as with all things in America, is ineluctably entangled with race. If we heed the lessons their history holds, we will find ourselves not only meeting new characters, but telling new stories. The black Catholic movement was born in the same decade that is often characterized as the triumphant arrival of American Catholicism. 
centering black Catholics can give us the tools to reimagine what that meant in the first place. And so today I come before you suggesting that the claim that the Catholic Church in the United States is primarily a white racist institution should intervene in how we talk about American Catholicism. It insists that we interrupt our regularly scheduled programming. For the better part of the past half century, the stories historians have told have centered on the birth of a people known as American Catholics and the creation of a tradition called American Catholicism. One need only glance at the, text, the, the titles of survey texts to note this fixation on American Catholics as a people and American Catholicism as a tradition. The story these texts tell is, I would guess, being in Notre Dame in this particular space, one that most of us are pretty familiar with. It's the story of how Catholics became American. Let me rehearse it for you in very brief, in case you don't. It is the story of how Catholics were once a feared and despised immigrant population who Protestants imagined to be inimical to, even incompatible with, what America was supposed to be. But, so the story goes, all of this changed. In the decades following the Second, the Second World War, Catholics became mainstream. Military service, educational achievement, and economic advancement combined to make Catholics virtually, or at the very least statistically, indistinguishable from other Americans. But black Catholics beg the question, what do we mean by American Catholic in the first place? Another way of putting this would be to say, what exactly did Catholics become when they became American? <clears throat> and from what I can gather from reading those survey texts with the titles of American Catholic and American Catholicism, we more or less mean that they became the Kennedys. Um, and that was, that was, I have written in my notes, pause for laughter, that was a joke. <laughs> there we go. Um, I'm only joking, but only kind of. Um, the Kennedys are, of course, exceptional figures. Most Catholics did not become wealthy, wheeling, and dealing politicos, right? Um, but there's a reason that if you open a survey of American Catholicism, they tend to turn on the 1960 presidential election. Um, in the words of historian James Fisher, the election of the nation's first Roman Catholic president was among the most triumphant <coughs> events in American Catholic history. I mean, what better emblem of Amer American Catholics making it could there be than a papist taking the White House, right? Um, this is how John Fitzgerald Kennedy tends to function for American Catholic history, uh, as a symbol of Catholic Americanness, an emblem of arrival into the mainstream, <coughs> a mile marker in the race that's kind of reaching its conclusion by the time you get to 1960. Um, as Jay Dolan notes in his classic, The American Catholic Experience, Kennedy did more than prove that Catholics could be president. For Catholics, and this is a quote, Kennedy became a symbol of success. Wealthy and well-educated, he had achieved the dream of every American, the presidency of the United States. End quote. So in other words, Kennedy signaled what was possible for American Catholics by 1960, namely anything, right? Charles Morris put it most directly in his book titled American Catholic when he concluded his book with the matter-of-fact statement that, quote, American Catholics have long since made it in America. As much as any other religious body, they are middle class, suburban, educated, affluent. They exercise control over their lives in ways that their grandparents never did." End quote. Now, I need to, especially since I'm in the company of great scholars, pause to note that some scholars are working to and have been working to complicate this narrative, right? Um, Peter D'Agostino, Robert Orsi, Dean McGreevy, Julie Byrne. Um, we have a number of scholars who are challenging this narrative but their complications notwithstanding, I would say that this story is as close to gospel as we get in capital H history. 
Um, it was on display when the Pope came to Washington not that long ago. TV broadcasts, popular podcasts, print and digital media alike all rehearsed this story to contextualize this Catholic moment in America. Less than two centuries ago, Catholic convents and churches were burned. Less than a century ago, the anti-Catholic Ku Klux Klan ran rampant. Barely 50 years have passed since the election of the nation's only Catholic president, and in 2015, American Catholics were so well integrated into American society that members of Congress, a third of whom are Catholic, could, without any controversy, invite the Pope to address them. And he could be flanked on top of that with a Catholic vice president on one side and a Catholic speaker of the house on the other, right? Um, so this is a story of how far we, we have come, right? Um, this story even made it onto late night TV. I don't know if any of you caught the late show with Stephen Colbert around this time. Um, hosted, of course, by the most critically acclaimed Catholic in the US, who, who hails from Charleston, South Carolina, I should add. Um, so, to mark the Pope's visit, he had a week's worth of programming featuring an interview with, of course, a Kennedy, um, and I couldn't make that up. Maria Shriver, the journalist and daughter of Eunice Kennedy Shriver, joined Colbert along with comedian Jim Gaffigan and writer Andrew Sullivan for a conversation that actually dealt quite a bit on the relative compatibility of Catholicity with Americanness. So when I first watched this interview, this interview with Colbert, Shriver, Gaffigan, and Sullivan, you know, I wondered, I asked myself, what black Catholics might make of this presentation? What Latino and Filipino Catholics might make of this presentation? This presentation of Catholicism, a conversation among well-to-do, white, Irish-descended American Catholics the Catholics who stood as inheritors of Kennedy's American Catholicism, who had achieved the dream of every American, quote unquote. And oddly enough, I was also thinking of James Baldwin, who in his reflection in 1965 on the American dream and the American Negro, remembered when the ex-Attorney General, Mr. Robert Kennedy, said that it was conceivable that in 40 years, America might have a Negro president. Baldwin recalled, and I'm gonna quote him at length, and I would apologize if it weren't James Baldwin. You can never apologize for quoting James Baldwin at length. Um, Baldwin recalled that that, st that statement sounded very emancipated to white people. The statement that maybe in 40 years from 1965, black people could have a black president. That sounded like a very emancipated statement to white people. Quote, they were not in Harlem when this statement was first heard. They did not hear the laughter and bitterness and scorn with which this statement was greeted. From the point of view of the man in the Harlem barbershop, Bobby Kennedy only got here yesterday, and now he's already on his way to the presidency. We were here for 400 years, and now he tells us maybe in 40 years, if you're good, we may let you become president." End quote. When we say Catholics became American, we do not mean that Catholics became Nat Turner or Harriet Tubman, Langston Hughes or Zora Neale Hurston, James Baldwin or Angela Davis. Instead, our turns of phrase, mainstream, middle class, suburban, American, mask our meaning. The American Catholic story as, as it has been told and retold renders innocent a more complicated tale of how the children and grandchildren of European immigrants became American Catholics to the extent that they paid the price of the ticket, as Baldwin put it, to become white. American Catholic history, as it tends to be told, marginalizes ever-present Native Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos. In other words, a whole host of other Catholic Americans. And it fails to recognize, on top of that, 
the ways European Catholics and their descendants, my great-grandfather who immigrated from Italy, my grandfather um, born in the Bronx, fails to recognize the ways that the Catholics who came to think of themselves as white, to borrow Baldwin's Turner phrase, participated in the maintenance of white supremacy in this country whether or not they were cognizant of their participation. The danger of the story of American Catholicism told in this way, as it has been told and retold, I think lies not so much in its falsity, but in its elisions and erasures. And I'll return to those elisions and erasures in a little bit. But I think now, about halfway through, it might be the point in which you're wondering, how can black Catholics help us understand the whole of American Catholicism, given the fact that, at least in the United States, black Catholics have always been a minority within a minority? After all, up until the turn of the 21st century, the majority of Catholics in the United States have been European immigrants and their descendants. So why shouldn't they serve as the center of our attention? And as I was framing this talk, I was asking myself that same question. Um, and as I was asking myself this question, my mind turned to ta Coates' case for reparations. And in that essay, Coates notes that the amnesia Americans often display with regard to recognizing our links to the past is that we tend to recognize our links to the past when they flatter us. But, Coates reminds us, black history doesn't flatter American democracy. It chastens it. And so it is with black Catholics. Black Catholic history, black Catholics chasten the history of American Catholicism. By moving them from the margins to the center, by reviewing U.S. Catholic history from their vantage point, we can begin to critically assess our constitutive categories, and American Catholicism is perhaps the foremost among them. So this is actually what I want to do with the rest of my time today. Um, I want to hear black Catholics talk back to American Catholic history. I want to introduce you to um, some black Catholic thinkers who give us the theoretical tools, um, the terms with which to reimagine American Catholicism. And so I want to return back to the start of the black Catholic movement with the clergy caucus 50 years ago. The black Catholic movement was, among many other things, a time of intense intellectual production when a class of black Catholic activist scholars took the church to task. Again, many of whose papers are collected here in the archives. In a very real sense, they revised and re-theorized the history of American Catholicism. So many of you um, may be familiar with Father Cyprian Davis, um, the illustrious and late great historian Cyprian Davis, um, who literally wrote the book on black Catholic history. Um, I actually want to begin by speaking about another Davis, Brother Joseph M. Davis, a Marianist brother from Dayton, Ohio. Brother Davis was present with Sister Gray as an observer of the inaugural Black Catholic Clergy Caucus gathering, and he was one of those activist scholars. He wrote scores of speeches and essays in his seven years of service as the first executive director of the National Office for Black Catholics. Um, whose papers are collected at the University of Notre Dame archives and that you can read for yourself. And a common thread in his writings was his building on an idea of what he called the missionary mentality that the church had when it came to African Americans. The institutional church, historically speaking, treated African descended peoples as perpetual outsiders, as foreigners in their midst. And this is kind of quoting from Brother Davis, insofar as the Catholic Church was part of the economic, political, and social structure of the country as it developed, it imbibed America's state of mind. 
namely that the white population were the true Americans and the black population were a tolerated minority. End quote. This rendered black Catholics not as full-fledged members of the mystical body, but rather, as Davis put it, as an outlet for practicing the works of mercy and for the heroic dedication of clerics and religious who found it necessary to go even a step above the sacrifice called for in their normal vocation. So in other words, it called on missionaries to kind of treat the black populations that they were serving as something kind of above and beyond what was actually called on them by their vocations. In short, the history of the Catholic Church in the black community of the United States, according to Davis, is a history of white missionaries sent to outposts, religious who dedicated their lives to a specialized, extraordinary work, the history of salvation brought to a dependent community. And as Davis noted, written clearly but invisibly into this concept was an attitude toward the people themselves who were being proselytized. I suggest that David's, I, Davis's, that Davis's identification of the missionary mentality represents a signal, historiographical, theoretical contribution for our field of American Catholic studies. And while missionary mentality is Davis's term for this particular phenomenon, he was not alone in his assessment of this history. Other activist scholars joined him, among them Sister Jamie Phelps, who in, in essays and interviews echoed this sense of the otherness inscribed on and imbibed by black Catholics. Phelps, who is, an Adrian, who is an Adrian Dominican sister and theologian and who was present for that initial National Black Sisters Conference, reflected in an interview much later on the ways that Irish, Italian, Polish, and German practices were understood to stand in for real Catholicism in ways that black culture never could. She recalls, for instance, how white priests left black churches for the suburbs in the late 1960s and 1970s, fleeing because, in her words, that's where they thought they had real Catholicism. This distinction between the real and the black was nowhere more apparent than in the disciplining of Catholic worship. Father Larry Lucas in his 1970, his explosive 1970 memoir manifesto titled Black Priest, White Church, Catholics and Racism. I highly recommend picking it up if you're interested in the subject. Father Larry Lucas notes that both black and white Catholics, quote, look upon some of the basic elements of black religious culture as distinctively Protestant and as contaminating pure Catholicism. Brother Joseph Davis noted this distinction in the treatment of black converts to Catholicism. He wrote, how often has a new convert been discomfited when he spontaneously answered amen, yes Lord, praise God, to a moving sermon by the priest preacher. Rather than accommodating Catholicism to the lives of black converts, black Catholics were acculturated, in Davis's words, to white Catholic religious expression as the right Catholic way, end quote. Father Clarence Joseph Rivers, the famed liturgist and yet another activist scholar, expanded on this same point. Rivers noted that black culture was clearly, quote, considered inferior, second class, at best, and inadmissible in tasteful worship. While the church is not supposed to be black or white, Greek or Jew, slave or free, as a matter of fact, the Roman Catholic Church in the United States has been and is radically white and frequently seems determined to remain so to the detriment of its Catholicity." End quote. So this is a second pause point. Before I go any further, I want to pause to say that I am not in the position to nor am I trying to adjudicate the authenticity of black identity. In the book, I go to great lengths again and again and again to insist that 
there is no one way to be black and Catholic. I insist this at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the book. Um, and I argue against the notion, um, for example, that black people were converting to Catholicism in the early 20th century in order to become white. Um, my book is titled Authentically Black and Truly Catholic, but the book itself is about all of the different ways that black Catholics themselves debated what it meant to be authentically black and truly Catholic, whether it was possible even to be authentically black and truly Catholic. So I don't want to be misread as suggesting that um, we read Davis and Phelps and Lucas and Rivers as stand-in somehow for the entirety of the black Catholic experience, for the entirety of black Catholic history and culture. But what they do do, what they do offer us, is a window into the ways racialization has constituted what we have innocuously called American Catholicism. These black Catholic activist scholars, these intellectuals, in a sense translate into theory and historiography the quotidian violence experienced by countless black Catholics and countless black people in proximity to other Catholics. Their essays and interviews represent only a handful of the innumerable and heartrending tales black Catholics bear and have borne in their bodies. Things that we might today call the micro and macro aggressions that have historically defined being black in a predominantly white institution. One way to read these stories would be to say that they're instances of Catholic racism. And you know, of course they are, they are that, right? Each time um, a young woman, a young black woman, was turned away by a white sisterhood, or still worse, accepted only to be tormented. Each time that a black boy or girl was told that real or pure Catholicism could not include all that black stuff, written clearly but invisibly into each of these experiences, were racist assumptions about the people themselves. But I want to suggest, and I think that these activist scholars suggest, that these are not only instances of Catholic racism, but also examples of the ways racialization worked to constitute American Catholicism itself. Each and every time black Catholics were made to feel other than less than. Each and every time they were juxtaposed with true Americans or real Catholicism. They were witness to the creation of what would eventually be categorized and codified by scholars as American Catholicism. The American Catholics, the Kennedys, the ones who have made it, the mainstream, the middle class, suburban, educated, affluent, the American Catholics who exercise control over their lives in the ways that their grandparents never did, these American Catholics we might put differently are the ones who left behind a whole host of others in their wake. So, what would it mean to reimagine American Catholicism? to restore those elisions and erasures? <coughs> what sort of history would we be reading if we centered black Catholics? If we allowed the black Catholic claim that the church in the United States is a white racist institution to intervene in our narratives, to interrupt us, to unsettle us? I think that it would do three things, at least, and I tend to think in threes because I am a product of a good Catholic university, like many of you in here. The first thing is that it would mean seeing people who we are not accustomed to seeing. And it would mean truly seeing them. Not as exceptional stories, not as extraordinary exhibits in a museum, but as essential to the human story we are trying to tell. The Congolese Catholics bought and brought to the Carolinas as slaves, 
who launched a revolt against enslavers on the feast of the Nativity of the Virgin Mary in 1739, who fought their way to the Stono River, perhaps hoping to escape to Fort Mose, the military religious settlement built by and for African Catholics in St. Augustine, Florida. The black women and men and children who, to quote the 10 black bishops of the United States in 1984, built the churches, tilled church lands, and labored with those who labored in spreading the gospel. And not just the Catholics, but to paraphrase Malcolm X, if I can, also the victims of Catholicism the peoples indigenous to the Americas that missionaries sought to subdue and civilize, the enslaved families whose labor and sale made Catholic institutions like Georgetown sustainable. Centering black Catholics would mean seeing all of them and many, many more. Second, it would mean seeing things we think we know but in ways we're not accustomed to seeing them. So let's return to our proverbial American Catholics. As an example of, sorry, let's return to those proverbial American Catholics, the ones who became virtually indistinguishable from other Americans by the middle of the 20th century. The GI Bill made it possible for the children and grandchildren of European Catholic immigrants to attend college in unprecedented numbers but only a fifth of black veterans ever received benefits. The federal government literally subsidized suburban mortgages for white Catholics at the same time that it redlined black neighborhoods in cities like Chicago and Detroit. When attempts were made to forcibly desegregate public schools and housing in cities like Chicago and Boston and Yonkers and many, many more, Catholics came out in droves to protest. Martin Luther King's march against racist real estate practices through Marquette Park in 1966 Chicago was met with mobs of white Catholics chanting white power. White mothers and fathers wrote letters to their archbishops insisting that they would withdraw their children from parish schools and withdraw their donations from offertory plates if schools desegregated. Now, these stories may be familiar to American historians, but they are rarely framed as stories about American Catholicism as such. These Catholics tend to be, though there are notable exceptions, tend to be rewritten, redesignated as working class, as blue collar white ethnics. But what if, what if the Boston busing riots were understood to be a signal event in the history of American Catholicism in the 20th century. Centering black Catholics would mean an end to the assumption that race only matters when we're talking about non-white people. That talking about Catholics and race is code for talking about Catholics of color. Third point, finally, it would mean moving beyond mere acknowledgement of these facts to a real reckoning with them. This is what ta Coates had in mind when he wrote that black nationalists, and here I think we can include our activist scholars of the black Catholic movement, <coughs> that black nationalists have, quote, always perceived something unmentionable about <coughs> America that integrationists dare not acknowledge that white supremacy is not merely the work of hot-headed demagogues or a matter of false consciousness, but a force so fundamental to America that it is difficult to imagine the country without it." End quote. It is not enough to say that bishops and priests and sisters own slaves. We must reckon with how holding human beings as property fundamentally shaped what it meant to be Catholic in America. It is not enough to note that ordinary immigrant Catholic men 
hung black bodies in the streets of New York City in their resistance to the Civil War draft. We must reckon with the ways gendered violence was one among other essential ingredients in making an American Catholic culture. It is not enough to add black activists to our discussions of post-conciliar Catholicism. We must reckon with the fact that white Catholic suburbanization is no less about race than black Catholics in the so-called inner city. When we talk about the creation of an American Catholicism, we cannot forget that the freedom on which America is founded was physically built and philosophically premised on the enslavement of human beings. We cannot forget that the United States only became a nation of immigrants after its original inhabitants had been killed or relocated. That the border first crossed Mexicans in an act of imperial expansion. Black Catholic history challenges claims to the Catholicity of Catholicism and the innocence of Americanism, and as a result, insists on a reimagining of American Catholicism. And so I'd like to end with an example that I think is illustrative of all these three points together. And to do so, I want to return to where I began. Um, literally, where I began this lecture, with one of the priests who helped inaugurate the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus and the Black Catholic Movement 50 years ago, but also um, where I began the research that eventually led me here, the research that eventually became my book. This project began when I learned about a movement and that movement led me to a particular man. A local grassroots struggle led by lay people in Chicago who called themselves the Concerned Black Catholics, organized in 1968 and 1969 to fight for Father George H. Clements. Ordained 60 years ago, last year, he had a big blowout party not that long ago, Clements was just the second black priest ordained by the Archdiocese of Chicago, and early in his career, he embarked on the path of activist priest. You could say that he was politically activated by Martin Luther King, first when he attended the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom with his parishioners in 1963, and later when he answered King's call to march from Selma to Montgomery for voting rights in 1965. But in a sense, he would be politically radicalized three years later when, as he put it, a bullet whizzed through the head of Martin Luther King. Clements was among the seven black priests to accuse his archdiocese of enlightened paternalism. He was one of the co-founders of the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus that declared the Catholic Church a white racist institution. And from that, as you might expect, he was not the Cardinal Archbishop's first choice to assign to a pastorate in Chicago. Um, Cardinal John Cody did not relish the idea of a fiery young priest pastoring a parish. And so, but when Cardinal Cody refused to promote Clements, he inadvertently sparked a movement for black Catholic self-determination in the city of Chicago. This movement, and Clements in particular, embodies the three ways centering black Catholics encourages us to reimagine American Catholicism. First, it introduces us to figures and events we're unaccustomed to meeting and seeing in U.S. Catholic history. For those of you who know or know of Father Clement's life work, it is a wonder to me always how he is not more of a household name. Um, he fought for and won, with the help of the concerned black Catholics, his pastorate of Holy Angels Parish, which he went on to establish as arguably the most prominent black Catholic community in the country in the latter half of the 20th century. He fought for and won the installation of a shrine to St. Martin Luther King. Um, he replaced a shrine to St. Anthony of Padua with a shrine to St. Martin Luther King. You can imagine how that went down in the... Archdiocese of Chicago, um, but he won it, its presence there. Um, 
he fought for and won the right to adopt children and gave birth to the One Child, One Church, One Child program. He even had a rather cheesy made-for-TV movie made, for, made about him that you can find. Um, so he, his life kind of leads us into the things that we perhaps don't see, those elisions and erasures that we can now begin to see. It also allows us to see things that we thought we knew, but in a new way. Like the Black Panther Party. Bet you didn't think I was going to go there. In the early days of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party, Clements was called on to mediate an internal dispute. And once it was successfully resolved, he came to be known affectionately as their honorary chaplain. Clements befriended the young charismatic leaders of the Chicago Panther Party, Fred Hampton and Bobby Rush. And they in turn came to bat for him when he went up against the archdiocese. January and February of 1969 witnessed Black Panthers in full regalia serving vigilant guard over black and white Catholics engaged in protest through masses in different churches across the city as they performed what they called pray ends, where they would literally kind of occupy the last rows in a church and pray their own alternate liturgy while the liturgy was going on. So imagine that, but then imagine Black Panthers strung out along the back of a church, right? This is certainly not our regularly scheduled programming in US Catholic history. Um, nor, I think, just to add, is this how we normally imagine the Black Panther Party, right? Um, this is a way that I think the study of black Catholics challenges not just what we assume about Catholic history, but also what we assume about African American history. Finally, Clements offered a critical assessment of what Catholicism was historically and offered an alternative vision for what Catholicism could be with black Catholics at the very center. And so I want to close with words from Father George Clements, to whom, along with my wife, my book is dedicated. His reflections here are reflections on what he called impossible dreams. And they come from, I have to say it again, a document I stumbled across right here in the Notre Dame archives as I was toiling away on my dissertation. In Cleveland, Ohio, in 1970, Father Clements called on black Catholics to remain faithful to, quote, the greatest dreamer who ever lived, Jesus Christ, by continuing to dream the impossible dream, end quote. His dreams were deeply inflected by the aspirations of the Second Vatican Council and black power. Clements yearned for a church where Catholic hospitals provided free medical care to the poor, where bishops, priests, and nuns embraced the poverty of the people around them, where no one sought to convert black people without understanding black people. Clements dreamed of a church where Martin Luther King Jr. is, accepted, is as accepted as a saint, as readily as St. Patrick, St. Boniface, or Our Lady of Chestahova. He knew, he knew that society had a way of killing its impossible dreamers. And when he said that, it was a statement he didn't make lightly, following the assassination first of King in 1968, and then of his friend Fred Hampton, friend Fred Hampton in 1969. Nevertheless, Clements echoed Fred Hampton when he declared that no one could really kill the impossible dreamer. So, in the end, I guess what I'm asking us all to do today is to dream a bit. To dream new histories, and perhaps, if it's not too bold, to, in doing so, work to dream for a new world. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. We have time for just a few questions. So the floor is open now. I'll let you call them. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I have a question about um, 
compared to elevation practices, I guess, in you know, the yeah, mid 20th century, um, and how racism and uh, how kind of blackness and Protestantism kind of interact. So thinking about kind of you know the church at that time, imagine as a minority community, it would have been difficult for them to to yeah, evangelize to you know other Protestants. Um, so in the case of a kind of black population, which are predominantly Protestant, how how do you kind of like tease out um, Catholics' attitudes towards that community and how yeah how their Protestant faith kind of yeah. attracts how they choices they make and yeah learn. yeah that's a great question um, thank you. Um, so, as a result of the great migrations, and you know this, right, um, but as a result of the great migrations, these Catholic metropolises across the country <coughs> become, in large swaths, black metropolises, right? Um, so, on the south side of Chicago, the west side of Chicago, you have these big Catholic parishes that are increasingly populated, um, the neighborhoods, um, by Protestant African Americans, right? Um, so, there are generally three responses that white Catholics make to this um, kind of transition of neighborhoods. One is to leave, um, to abandon parishes. Um, one is to actively resist, um, to like actually organize kind of turf defending associations to fight against um, the influx of African Americans into what was perceived Catholic to be Catholic turf. Um, but, and this is what I spend um, kind of the first half of my book talking about, um, a kind of small and exceptional number, exceptional in like the truest sense of the word, like as being few, um, priests and missionaries decide to reimagine entire neighborhoods as foreign missionary fields. To treat African Americans on the south side of Chicago, in Detroit, in Cleveland, in Toledo, as if they were missionizing in other parts of the world, right? Um, and so the message is very much that we are the one true church, um, and kind of through us you will find salvation. And this happens largely through Catholic schools. Um, so in Catholic schools, um, African Americans, Catholic and non-Catholic, are enrolling their children, and they're becoming Catholic in large part due to um, the kind of combination of education and evangelization that missionaries had operated. Um, an interesting note. This is precisely the missionary mentality that Joseph Davis and others are critiquing. Right? They're, they're, they're critiquing this notion or the, the way that the church has treated African Americans as this foreign population, as this kind of group of others in their midst. Um, treating them, you know, literally kind of like describing the south side of Chicago as a land of heathens in need of salvation, right? Um, what's interesting uh, is that um, black Catholics in the black Catholic movement, or at least some of them, um, challenge the kind of uh, racial logic of that, but maintain some of the practices, the evangelizing practices. Um, so Father George Clements, who runs Holy Angels uh, Parish, who hires Paul, Father Paul Smith to run uh, Holy Angels School, integrates kind of black nationalist teachings with Catholic missionary practices. Um, and that's part of what makes the school so successful. So you have non-Catholics and Catholics alike being required to go to mass every Sunday, being required to attend religious instructions, um, being required to learn as much about transubstantiation as about Angela Davis and Mahalia Jackson. Um, so um, I, I'm reaching the end of my answer, which is usually the point where I'm wondering if I answered your question. But um, it, it's a it's a kind of complicated relationship and one that um, that uh, Black Catholics, the Black Catholics I'm talking about in the talk, are kind of explicitly critical of. But in some instances, like inadvert or intentionally or unintentionally kind of incorporating ideas from as well. So it's kind of a complex, I call it over and over again in the book, I call it a fraught relationship. Um, fraught in lots of different ways. Um, and, and one of them being that white missionaries clearly had a kind of paternalist and sometimes out overtly racist um, approach to the people they were working with. 
but were nevertheless genuinely concerned about the salvation of the people that they were working with. Um, and that the black Catholics and non-Catholics who interacted with them also had like fraught, you know, loved Catholic schools, but also were extremely aware of the violence of, um, of Catholics and Catholic institutions. Yeah, great question. Uh, it's in the back and then I'll come this way. Okay, um, I would love to hear more um, about how you think the centering of the black Catholic experience within the popular imagination uh, might or should occur at like a parish level or a diocesan level and kind of away from academic theology or like the higher levels of the church hierarchy. That's a really good question. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah. How? I mean, that's really the, you know, it's, as, I, as I think through this, like, part of me wants to, like, encourage people to go on the parish circuit and to, like, because I do think that, and that's what I, you know, when I say that, like, the story about the Catholics becoming American is as close to gospel as it gets, like, I'm, by that I mean, like, not, you know, historians are challenging it, but like this is the story that people rehearse. Like this is the story that um, we hear over and over again. This is the story often rehearsed in response to claims for reparations, in response to claims of racism. The response is, well, my people came after slavery, right? My people came after that. Um, so yeah, how do we get that message out of the academy and into parishes? Um, I'm presenting at St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Charleston <laughs> in May. Um, I, you know, I really think that um, I don't have a clear answer to you. I, I, I kind of want to like respond that you've just like given us a call to arms. Like I think that this is, and I hope you could hear it in my talk, like something that I think actually um, pertains to scholars, but pertains to scholars because scholars are in the world um, and and should change the way we view the world. Um, I don't think Stephen Colbert is gonna like have me on so I can like tell the late night, you know, <laughs> house about this, but um, yeah, that's a, it's just a really good question. Thank you, and I don't have to think more deeply about it, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kressler. Uh, the My question and comment relates to the uh, gentleman's comment uh, about evangelization practices. Because I have found, as a black Catholic working in black Catholic communities and in, in, in Catholic institutions, um, that in many ways my white brothers and sisters have backed away virtually completely from uh, evangelization. Uh, and so when you describe that tension that black Catholics live in, I, I, I find myself living in, in, in that uh, as well, uh, between um, uh, an example would be a, a new a new grade school on the west side of Chicago, uh, where all of the uh, faculty members the, uh, are virtually all almost all of them are white. Uh, most of them are Notre Dame students, former Notre Dame students, uh, and they have come to the to the west side to teach young uh, black men, um, young black boys, great. Uh, 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 middle school age, uh, and they have personally deeply conflicted feelings about sharing the faith, mm -hmm. and yet it is a Catholic school, mm -hmm. right? And so when and so then when you illuminate the reality of that, uh, all of the white faculty are Catholic, and all of the non-white, which doesn't inc uh, also includes non-black, but all of the non-white faculty and staff are not Catholic, and then say to the, to the staff, the students aren't stupid. They see that, and what that says to them is, Catholicism is white. Um, as a black Catholic, you worry about the, the future of black Catholicism. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, and I, I, or I worry, I'll speak for myself, I worry about the future of black Catholicism. Um, and I also would say, the young woman said, how can we bring this to the parishes, but how can we bring this to the university? Mm -hmm. Right? In our pastoral practice, when was the last time voices sang at the cathedral, or the, at the basilica? Mm -hmm. 
when was the last time it was a black Catholic celebration on campus? Right? Um, and where are they, the black Catholics who are here? Um, are we gathering? Are we seeing? These are the questions that I have that, um, that you know, are coming from, from what you had to say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and it connects, actually, to a conversation I was having with Kathy earlier and the Cora group, where I really think that what the black Catholics that I'm talking about, but as you say, right, as you live, like black Catholics to this day offer, is a different vision of what it means to be Catholic in the first place. Um, so when Catholic schools in the inner cities are being closed in the 60s and 70s, black Catholics are making forceful arguments um, to maintain them. They're being closed according to archdiocesan officials because, well, their populations are mostly non-Catholic, right? Which is kind of functioning as code for black, right? Or not white, right? We need to move these institutions where where Catholics are, right? And the response by black Catholics is not, no, we are like it's only Catholics. It's no, we're going to call you to a different kind of Catholicism, a Catholicism that is a Catholicism of service to all. Um, and so the call is, yeah, actually, schools, Catholic schools, under the imperative of the gospel, are called to serve all people. And especially in the case of the 1970s, you know, 1970s South Side Chicago, those most in need, right? working poor black communities, um, Latino communities, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, and I think that there is a kind of, there is a vision for a different way of being and living Catholicism, um, if we're willing to hear it. Um, hear it in parishes, hear it in universities, hear it in homes, right? Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah. First, thanks for such a stimulating talk. Um, so I think it would be uncontroversial to say Euro-American Catholics absorbed the racism so dominant in American society, propagated it, lived with it, enacted it over a long period of time. I think we'd agree there. Where we might disagree, and I'm thinking about how we put, because I love the stimulating question, it, I, the question really is, how does it look different if you put African-American Catholics, or you put, I might add, race at the center of American Catholic history. We'd agree in the absorption of racism by Euro-American Catholics and their descendants. Where we might disagree is how we evaluate two groups. One is the white Catholic clergy, who in contrast to, for example, Euro-American Jew Jewish you know, you know, rabbis, or Euro-American white Protestant ministers remain in African-American neighborhoods much longer, have a much deeper commitment actually to evangelization, in fact, are admired for that. Do we look at them as imperialists? Um, yeah. I, I wonder if that's a fully charitable reading. So I'd, I'd be interested to get your reaction to that. Yeah. And then similarly, if we put African-American Catholics at the center, one narrative, which you sketch out nicely, is a, a kind of radical Catholic moment, and that's the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus and, and what you described there. Another narrative, and I, I wonder, did you find this in the sources, uh, would be pretty socially conservative group, African American Catholics, more devoted to Catholic schools than Euro American Catholics, yeah. and, and what, quite passionate about it, uh, liturgically conservative, at least I think up until a generation ago and even maybe more liturgically conservative than a lot of Euro-American Catholics. And that narrative doesn't end in radicalism. That narrative you know, can end in, who would you say is the most prominent African-American Catholic today in the country? Uh, Wilton Gregory would be one of the ones that come to mind. Yeah, okay, I, I would agree. Uh, but I would say someone like Clarence Thomas. Oh, as Clarence, far as yeah, a lay, right, 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 right. And, and that's a different that's, narrative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So help me, just help reflect with me the white Catholic clergy and the African American Catholics, if you put them at the center, is there another reading that <coughs> Yeah. Um, so with the white Catholic clergy, um, 
I, and this was, goes back to the word I, when I chose fraught, right? Um, in the book, in the talk, well, maybe less so in the talk, but in the book, definitely, um, I am constantly trying to tread a few lines without going too far on one side or too far on the other. Um, and I don't think, I, I guess my response about white clergy is that I don't think it's mutually exclusive for a priest or sister to be paternalist, um, even racist, or engaged in a kind of colonial project, and also to be genuinely, I mean, and I don't mean that like in a sarcastic way, to like be wholeheartedly committed to the lives of the people they're serving. Um, uh, so, so that was, so I, I think, I think that the two can be, simul can be simultaneously true. And, and when you're referring to kind of white priests and sisters staying in cities longer, it made me think, you know, with the black Catholic movement, their, their call is not just to black Catholics, but also people that they refer to as black, think black thinking white Catholics, um, which is they're borrowing language from kind of the black nationalist moment of the time. Um, so they're certainly not kind of dismissing or kind of outright kind of like rejecting white Catholics as part of the process. Um, you're right that they have a particular vision about what it means to be black and Catholic. And, and, and the book is really about historicizing that. It's really about saying the title is maybe somewhat deceptively entitled kind of boldly, authentically black and truly Catholic, which is a quote. Um, but really it's about the debates about what that meant. What does it mean to be authentically black? What does it mean to be truly Catholic? Um, and in a sense, the, 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 the argument is not inevitably, or at least not fully, won by the people who are saying the Catholic Church is a white racist institution. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I, I acknowledge that I'm definitely choosing like one thread in, in black Catholic history. Um, and um, one that still, I think, exists, um, but one among many. And, I, yeah, and, and as I kind of caveated earlier, I'd never want to be read as kind of insisting that this is a kind of the entirety of the black Catholic view of things. Um, student earlier, I, I saw reading Brian Massingale's um, book on Catholic racism, presumably for a class, thank you to whoever assigned that book. Um, but he is, his current project is about recovering Malcolm X as a theological source uh, for Catholic thinking. Um, and, um, you know, he kind of, I, I would say, kind of, is kind of following in the footsteps, in a sense, of the Larry Lucases and, and uh, Sister Grays of the world. Um, but yeah, to be black and Catholic is to be innumerable different things in the same way to be human is to you know, be innumerable things. Um, yeah. Oh, lots of questions. I, I don't have know where to go. One more question. One more question. Uh, and then, uh, so I'll answer questions, and then afterwards, I'm also happy to, to stay afterwards and, and, and answer questions. Yes, sir. Um, I, I haven't read the book, so I don't know whether you covered anything at all. But what about the Catholics who have always been Catholic and whose families yes. have always been Catholic? And, for example, the Catholics, Catholic, black Catholics that fought with Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans, you don't hear that they were also Catholic. Yeah. Or the black Catholics that were the first blacks to fight in the Civil War at, at, and in Louisiana at, at the first battle before the one that made TV in a movie. Yeah, yeah. The black Catholics from the South were already fighting for the Union, yeah, yeah. and we don't hear anything about that. In fact, they were a lot of them were excommunicated by the bishop for participating in the battles that caused so many of them to die. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. So the book, my book, is specifically about 20th century Chicago. But in the introduction, because I'm, you know, so the book is spending most of its time talking about people who convert to Catholicism. In the introduction, I pause to point out that actually when we think about Catholics in the Americas, if we think about Catholics in the Western Hemisphere, if we break out of our US-centric framework, the majority of Catholics in the Western Hemisphere are not white. Um, and the majority of black Christians are Catholic uh, or are kind of Catholic adjacent, right? Um, and so yeah, the, the history of black Catholicism um, 
specifically in the United States. Speci right. Even specifically in the United States, in New Orleans, in Baltimore, right, in, in the whole, you know, in the Holy Land, quote unquote, of Kentucky, um, is, is is black and Catholic from the get go, right? The first ca among the first Catholics, and this is from Father Cyprian Davis's history, among the first Catholics to come to the Americas, to come to the southern part of the United States, was someone described as a Moorish or African um, Catholic. So yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, the Catholics are not, um, black Catholics are not a convert population, right? Um, they are both convert and gener multiple generation, generation after generation after generation. So um, thank you all for being here, but I'm happy, I'll just stay here. So if you have a question, I'd be happy to answer any afterwards. But thank you so much for um, being here and enjoy the warm weather. And thank you, Matthew. You've obviously challenged us as scholars, uh, challenged us in terms of pastoral practice. I know the audience represents a, a diverse interests and commitments to this, so I, uh, I think you've given us a lot to think about, and definitely read the book, too. Um, yeah, that too. So, and, and again, thank you all for coming. Um, at your seats is a copy of the American Catholic Studies newsletter, which mentions our upcoming events. And um, stay tuned especially for the event in November, which we're co-sponsoring with Hesburgh Library, That's which amazing. will continue. Yeah. Maybe you can come back for yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say, I, was like, I want to be there. <laughs> I want to go there. All right. Well, please join me in thanking you.